In this box here is what I expect will be the best 3D printer yet coming from the new brand of 3D printers from China, Mingda. And you guys know that I've been championing this brand. I've got the D2 and the D4 here. The D4 was just incredibly useful for the last month printing large format prints. Go watch the last video if you want to know what I was making. And um, yeah, it's, it's worked out quite well, although um, the, the D4 did need some polish. This is par for the course from China. They sell us sort of a beta test unit and expect us to kind of upgrade it. Um, so I've had problems where the like wires here got sucked under the uh, hot end and the hot end melted through the wires and shorted it out, burned out the electronics, but that's okay because I uh, usually upgrade the electronics with a Duet 2 Wi-Fi control board anyway. So did those upgrades and it was functioning great. And now, oh, I've got kind of a new problem happening where I've got some ooze coming out of the top of the heated block after you know 20 hours of printing, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, this hot end, though, that where you think, you know, I'm just calling out a problem on it. So you think that that's the Achilles heel and the thing that they need to replace, maybe by uh, putting like some a good E3D V6 and a Bontech extruder on there, right? Oh, that, that'd be a good idea, a good upgrade. But no, you see, this is an original design from Mingda. Nobody else has produced anything like this. And it's very inexpensive, which means we pay less for the printers, yet it's very functional. The problem is it's not polished. They did not spend the time to get all the little details right, to get all the machining tolerances just right, to get the holes just the right size. This is kind of, yeah, a beta test unit. This is, it works, get it out the door and sell it. And when they sold it and they started to have the problems that I'm seeing now, instead of refining it and making this design better, they abandoned their in-house awesome design that, that, that set them apart from everybody else, from all the other you know, clones and copycats in China. This alone set Mingda apart and they've abandoned it and they have put an E3D V6 and a Bontech clone copycat product onto their printers instead of this. So even though the new printers, which we'll talk about both of them, the Mingda Rock 3 and the Mingda Rock 3 Pro here in the box, uh, even though those are more functional printers because the hot end is upgraded to the Western copycat uh, product, I don't like it. I don't like it. So we have a case here where we have a better printer that I'm upset with. So take that as you will. If you want to buy the, the cloned product because you don't think that there's an issue, um, you know, stealing other people's intellectual property you know, for, for a Chinese company to do that, you don't think that's a problem, then hey, that, that's on you. And, and I'm going to give you guys all the information. You can see what I'm, what I'm talking about here. But I just, I think they should have stuck with this. They should have refined it and they could have had just as good of a printer with their own intellectual property. And instead of doing that, they did the typical Chinese thing. And it's just, it's so disappointing. All right, let's bust into this box and look at what's gonna be the best printer that we've seen from them yet. Right, so there is the Mingda Rock, which I did a live show, a live broadcast, um, unboxing and, and talking about that. Yeah, so this one I expect to be very similar to the first one. I do like this color. I'm gonna say that. I do like the, uh, the style of this. Um, you guys see that? Nice orange color there. All right, well, this is extremely well packaged and I can see why they were uh, like anxious or, or <laughs> they really wanted to send this printer to me. So I can see why it's uh, it is upgraded. I like these, these new brackets, um, things that were previously plastic, they've now got in metal and uh, they got a new paint job on it, which is kind of nice. So this is without a doubt an upgrade. Yeah, see what I mean about the, uh, the new bracketry? That's really quite nice. And they got the, uh, the anti-backlash nuts, not, needed really not needed but um because gravity holds that so we don't have a backlash problem in the z direction but you know nice to have and it's just really clean and a lot more professional looking here on the um, hot end we've now got a silicone boot that did not come with any of the other mingdas and like i said there's the knockoff bond tech and the knockoff e3d v6 hot end the part cooling as usual is not a split part cooling 
You need to start making that. I'm, I'm tired of making those. Tired of making those. Tired of having to design those for every single printer that I ever get. So anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that's where that sits. So let's get this assembled. All right, it's time to nitpick. I'm seeing a lot of interesting things on this printer. Clearly, every decision was made with uh, an increase in quality in mind. Uh, some of these things are meh, and some of them are just like pfft. Anyway, let's start with the um, hot end here, the, the cap stand mechanism, the, the actual you know part that pushes the filament, extrudes the filament. We can see uh, Bontex style gears, and judging by the quality of the cutting on the gears, it's possible those were actually purchased from Bontech. I have not received word from Mingda or from Bontech whether or not these are genuine or not. So, you know, take it as it comes. But uh, they could be. They could be genuine. Maybe Mingda's playing nice. That um, it does not say E3D on the sock there. So chances are better than not that that is not a genuine E3D. Although, again, uh, I do know that E3D does sell to some Chinese companies, so there's a possibility that these are not knockoffs. There's a, a small outside chance, I, I don't know. Now let's talk about all these orange brackets because they are a definite upgrade to what we've seen on the previous uh, original Mingda rock and uh, also an upgrade to the Mingda D2 and D4 Pro. So um, here we have a tensioning nut, so you would loosen that screw right there and tension that down until you could feel the belt tension just right underneath there. So I've actually dialed that into where I like it. And that's a really nice detail, it really is. So uh, I, I definitely appreciate that. Over here we see the Z limit stop. And this wire gets in the way. It's just, you could easily see a moment where the, the, the screw here would pinch the wire between the, the limit stop. I mean, I guess they put this piece of thickening, you know, heat shrink on there to try to keep it from um, from getting in the way but I'm not convinced I think it's gonna I think it's gonna cause a problem at some point they did do it right here with the uh, with the thickened um, cabling that's a nice rigid connection makes a nice arch so highly unlikely it doesn't even I mean it's hard for me to force it under there I can get it under there but that's not gonna happen during a print it wants to stay upright so I would say that problem is solved and that's a non-issue. Here on the y-axis we see that same tensioning knob which is again an awesome thing to see. Now in assembling this printer um, I had four screws on each side. There's one, two on the T-bracket here and then those long screws went in from the side which is again like I said everything they did was an attempt at increasing the quality. So you don't have to turn the printer upside down to install those screws from underneath any longer. Uh, it's a nice usability thing for the, for the, for the end user, but um, I'm not convinced that that's a great move. The two screws as they come in from the bottom uh, really uh, tighten down the vertical member here to the frame. And if there's a nice square cut on that vertical member and the frame is well made, then the two are like aligned much better with that tension in that direction. By having four screws in this direction, it's just redundant. You already have two holding it. You don't need, I mean, these are like through screws, like they go all the way through it, but they're not, they're not helping to orient and align the frame. So I think these are redundant. You just need the two small ones and they should come from the bottom. That's from a technical engineering standpoint, that's the better technique, even though this is better from a usability standpoint. But I mean, come on, it's like an extra, 30 seconds of work to flip the printer over and do that. I don't know. And here, not only do we have the anti-backlash nuts, we also have this like floating uh, Z axis like point. So uh, if you think about that, the, um, the Z never changes. There's just enough float for side to side movement. So that means that they don't need to put a flexible coupler down here. And so the flexibility in the system is moved to this point instead, which is quite nice. I think actually that's pretty clever. If a little bit involved, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of little CNC cutting to do and everything. And I don't know that there's really that much gained. These nice rigid vertical axis, um, vertical Z axis, you know, motion rails. These are the extrusions. So they're the frame as well as the motion, uh, you know, control. And those are nice. Those are plenty stiff to resist the small amount of deflection that you would get from an asymmetric 
or eccentric, I should say, an eccentric motion uh, induced by the um, by the lead screw here. So, eh, meh, cool, looks cool, neat functionality, fancy, but not necessary. And the whole goal is to get the cheapest printer out the door if possible. So you could definitely save some money there. You can just do it the way that it's always been done uh, by using flexible couplers down here instead. Although, you know, it's a, there's a possibility that this is less expensive than a flexible coupler. I doubt it, but it's possible. I don't know how it works in China. And here in the back, up at the top, we can see this belt, which connects the two lead screws together. This is an awesome feature. It has dual lead screws, but it doesn't need them because they're tied together with this. So um, it's kind of a redundant deal to have two lead screws and also uh, them, you know, married with each other. But what this does, and this is awesome, if you have this, it's my experience that this is a replacement for a bed leveling sensor. Once you get the bed height dialed in one time, it typically, unless you really bump the printer or do something bad to it, it's going to stay aligned. Everything's going to stay where it needs to stay because of this belt. So massive props to them. This was a very good, very, very good thing to add. Here we see the, um, the what is this, the filament spool holder and accompanying filament runout sensor, which is, uh, you know, could be better. You see, um, if I put this fat roll of filament, and this is the, the wider roll, and it, they fixed that, so it now fits on there just fine, and the flange, it all works out. But um, you'd, you'd want this, you know, the filament coming off the roll here to come off in the center of the printer so that, you know, you're typically going to be printing down here in the center, so you want to keep that to be as straight of a filament path as possible. Instead, what they're requiring me to do is to throw this on here like so, and feed it through from the side. So as long as I'm kind of printing in this corner, it's a nice straight filament path, but that does flex. So that can flex all the way over to where it needs to go. Uh, and that's nice. So um, yeah, the binding issues from the previous design, this design here, this is bad. So they fixed that and this is better. So uh, that's a nice upgrade. I do appreciate that. It's just, you know, just nitpicking. In fact, this is perfectly viable. And finally, let's talk about the bed down here. Uh, this is pretty impressive. Um, it looks to be a version of the Ultra Base glass, which is a really durable bed surface. And I appreciate durable bed surfaces because inevitably at some point you're going to have your height wrong and you're going to be dragging that hot nozzle across the print surface, which when you have a nice tough print surface, it doesn't get damaged. I mean, you can, you can damage this. You, it's not indestructible but um, it's gonna survive a lot of wear and tear, whereas this you know, flexible um, knockoff, what is this, build tax stuff, um, doesn't survive. So this is much better, this is a definite upgrade. Now I'm upset that they didn't include a knife in this package, but most of us have a putty knife and you need to have a nice flexible putty knife. And you can see I've taken my Dremel tool and I've cut a single bevel knife edge on there. So that is not sharp enough to really cut anything except for like a carrot maybe. I mean, it's it's sharp, but it's not like, you know, shave your hair off the back of your hand sharp. And this is what you need, a sharp edge to put under the bed or to put onto the bed like that. You flex the handle up so that it's sitting flat and then you slide that across and under your prints. And if you do that technique and you hold the bed back behind your knife, you're not going to slice your hand, right? That's the big thing. There's so many pictures on the internet of people having sliced their hands in, in previous years when this was the only technique. So if you do the technique right, I really appreciate this technique. It's every bit as good as the, the flexible. This is a little bit more convenient, kind of, but uh, I like this. So usually these um, ultra base pieces of glass are um, like glued down to the print bed, but check this out, you guys. It pops off. And you can see these corners have this like indication on them, and that is some sort of a sticky, I don't know, maybe it's double-sided Kapton tape. I think that's what it is. I think it's double-sided Kapton tape. Now, thankfully, I have an extra roll of the double-sided Kapton tape. I think most of you guys aren't gonna have that, so, I don't know if you can get double-sided Kapton tape easily on eBay or whatnot. Maybe they should have sent us some extra stickers in case these ones wear out. 
Anyway, I need to wipe that down with some isopropyl alcohol so that my prints will stick to it. The final detail that I really like to talk about is the, um, the, the on off button and the plug are here at the side. So not hidden around the back like they are with every other printer ever. Something about the European standards, you gotta have the on off switch next to the plug at the back or so, I don't know, it's silly. But hey, that's a nice workaround. And we're looking at the typical Ming to interface and also once again, nitpicky, but I just don't like the fact that the SD card is upside down. You can't put it in the way that you would expect. You have to put it in with the contacts facing upwards. And here under the hood, we're seeing the same electronics that I've seen on all four of these Mingda printers. And that is this 32-bit ARM control processor here with Trinamic or Trinamic cloned, I don't know what they are, but they're, they're definitely using Trinamic technology uh, under, the, under these heat sinks. So those are the stepper motor drivers, and there are, what, one, two, three, four, five of them, which means that the two Z motors each get their own um, control chip, which is nice. Uh, that's nice. So yeah, they've done a really good job on the Z axis. Up here in this corner, we see the screen, and this is its own control unit. That's a, that gets its own firmware and everything. And this is the reason that you cannot easily add a BL touch sensor to this printer. Maybe Mingda is getting their acting gear and they're making this more upgradable with the electronics that they provide to you. But um, as it stands, I don't even ever want to deal with this. I'm just going to tear these out and stick a duet control board in there. Uh, that's my preferred easy, hassle-free upgrade. Granted, it's a little bit expensive, but well worth the price to me. They always cut corners on these Chinese electronics and uh, they don't make it easy for you to upgrade, which is exactly the opposite of the Duet. Okay, down here, we see a typical uh, power supply. Nothing to talk about really, just your typical 24 volt power supply. But the connections are nice. They've got the typical hot glue. I don't know why they do this, it's so stupid. They got this beautiful you know, screw terminal connection that's never gonna come apart and then they put hot glue on it. It's just, it just makes things messy. I don't know, I guess it's like a quality control thing, but I hate that. Anyway, the, uh, the connections look good. They're all covered down here where the mains voltage comes in. So um, everything is well and insulated from shocks and everything's labeled. So they've done a really good job. So this is interesting. They're including the quality checklist for the printer in the box. So they're clearly making an effort to really nail the quality on this brand and I think they're successful. So um, yeah, really high quality as far as I'm seeing. Anybody who gets a printer and is new to printing, really advantageous to go sign up on the Facebook page for your printer, for your brand. And of course there's a YouTube channel and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, and a Cura, Cura profile included on the SD card here. The fan noise is not too bad, you guys. You can see I've got the, um, the hot end up to temperature. So that fan is going strong and it's not too loud. I also have the part cooling fan running at the moment. So the loudest fan on this printer is uh, underneath in the uh, power supply. Let's see if I turn the bed on, we can hear that one kick on underneath there. The movement is absolutely silent with the Trinamic drivers. So it's not bad with the, uh, with the sound, could be better. This fan is kind of small, small fans are always noisy, although seems to be a pretty quality fan because it's really not that loud considering just how diminutive it is. Pretty happy with the noise level. Let's compare the regular Ming to Rock 3 to the Pro version here. Starting with the regular printer and the things that I don't like. Number one on that list is this print surface. It is really nice to have a detachable, flexible surface as far as um, popping large prints off of this bed, but this surface sucks. It is not at all durable. And for an example of that, let's look at the Mingda D4 print surface here in my hand. And you can see all of this damage on the sides, this permanently sort of marred surface. And this is after, oh, I don't know, 10 or so prints. So uh, I was printing too close to the bed. The, the nozzle was actually kind of scraping the bed out here, which is bound to happen, especially on a printer without um, automatic uh, mesh bed leveling and without a, um, a belt across the top. So you're bound to get your print height wrong at some point. And if you're printing with PETG, God help you. 
you will never ever get that PETG off of this print surface. So very easy to destroy this print surface. Now you can go and get yourself a sheet of um, flexible um, spring steel and that will stick to the magnetic bed here instead of um, you know this sheet. And what you can see I've done here is um, adhere some Gerolite for printing nylon and I adhered that to the spring steel. But the unfortunate thing is these both come in 30 centimeter sizes and this is like 320 centimeters, the, the actual bed on the Ming Rock 3. So getting a perfect fit uh, for your printer is kind of a challenge. So yeah, I basically the bottom line is that bed is not ideal. Another thing that sucks about this printer is the filament runout switch. It is made out of metal, so if you're running abrasive filaments through it, it will last longer, but I find that this causes problems because it's not flexible. So a much better solution here with this um, you know, flexible one that can just kind of find the right orientation so you're not gonna bind on that uh, switch. And finally, I was just talking about it a second ago, but the lack of a, um, of a belt tying the two stepper motors together is a pain in the butt. It means that you have to level the gantry to the frame every time you turn the printer on or every time it's sort of like, if it gets bumped. I mean, not every time. If you, if you really never touch it and it's just sitting in the corner and you don't breathe on it wrong, then that, that gantry doesn't get out of whack. But see, if one lead screw rotates but the other one stays static, then the gantry gets out of alignment. And then you have to realign the gantry. And after you realign the gantry, you have to relevel your bed on all four corners. Here on the pro version, everything is better. The ultra base print surface glass bed is just so much more durable. You can grind that nozzle along that print surface. And I mean, probably everything's gonna be exactly the way that it looks right now. You're hardly gonna damage it at all. I have damaged these. It is possible with a very hot nozzle, dragging it, grinding it, and then taking like a sharp knife to it um, at an angle, not, not the flat like technique that I showed earlier. So it is possible. These are not impervious to damage, but it's just much, much more durable. I love the, um, the knobs here that help you tension the belts. Although, you know, I find that I can tension these belts just fine without the knobs. It's a little bit more of an art, but it, it's possible. The gantry is thicker. This is a thinner gantry. And of course this has the belt that connects the two Z stepper motors so you never need to level the gantry. So is this printer worth $100 more than that printer? Yep, I would say so. Just the bed is like a $50 upgrade and that belt, if you can find a kit or make your own, that would cost you another 20, 30 bucks. So if you add up all the little things, it's definitely um, worth the $100. I'm experiencing the only major problem that I think I'm gonna ever have with this printer. These four corners of tape are inadequate for the job. I currently have the printer set at 100 degrees for the bed temperature, which means that the same thing that happens on all 3D printers, the bed has bowed. So there's currently a crowning in the middle and it's gonna be a dome. It's gonna be kind of crowning towards all, all the sides there. And what this means is it's pushing up in the middle against the plate glass, which is not able to warp as much as the aluminum. And that has caused the plate to detach from the aluminum underneath it. There's an easy enough solution. Everybody probably has some binder clips. And once you put the binder clips on, the, uh, the tape certainly helps the bed stay in place. It doesn't move anymore. However, um, this is an obstacle that your print nozzle could run up against. So I do recommend uh, that everybody go get a set of Swiss clips like this. You can find them uh, on the internet in places, on eBay, that kind of thing. Patented, Swiss clip, Swiss made. So you basically just stick that on there like so and you have a very minimal intrusion onto your print surface. This is the other type of Swiss clip and it's less expensive but you have to modify it into this shape and because it is spring steel, it's easy to break it as you're modifying it. So best if you just stick with this style of Swiss clip. And you have to put the clips on front to back because if you put them on side to side like so, you're gonna run into the, um, the vertical members of the frame. So this is the orientation that you need, which means that this stupid bit of wiring back here is now doubly problematic because you're gonna catch it. See what that's gonna do? No bueno. 
guess you can do it like this and then take that off. Oh, look at that. It just catches it. And it won't allow the bed to move back now. Yeah, this wiring is, is really poor. There's another consideration about the bed warping uh, under heat besides having to use clips to hold the glass down. And that's the fact that um, it's not a perfectly planar thing. And that means that it would be nice to have a bed leveling sensor measuring the undulations of the bed. Just how it's crowned or dished or saddled or whatever it is. Um, as it is, I can get this to stick, but I can only imagine if I was trying to print, you know, wall to wall on this bed, it's closer to the nozzle in the middle than it is at the edges, which means that it would be nice to be compensating for that um, change in bed height in software, in firmware. But we can't do that uh, because there is no ABL bed leveling feature on this printer. We're just reliant on the belt up here, which does a pretty good job. It gets us like 90% of the way there. Looking here on the Rock 3, we can see how the uh, stock part cooling fan was mounted. And I made this split cooling bracket, but you can see it very quickly has to turn that air like 90 degrees, um, which is really bad for airflow. Uh, you're gonna lose a lot of, of uh, CFM. This is the reason that I've come up with this design where the fan is mounted almost horizontally and uh, the duct is just much cleaner. So uh, the final version just finished printing here. You can see I've gone through one, two, three iterations, uh, four if you count if you count this one. <laughs> and the great thing about this design is the um, part cooling fan duct is easily removed. So if you want to print like this, like with some higher temperature filament, or maybe you just want that great view of the uh, print nozzle as you're printing, um, you've got that option and you can stick it right back on there. It actually is a friction fit to get it seated, but I've got these little holes here which um, receive a piece of filament, one on this side, one on the other side, and that locks the fan shroud into place. And we see that nice dimple in the water right there at the nozzle for good 360 degree cooling right there where the hot filament's getting spit out of the nozzle. For comparison, you can see that the stock cooling duct just kind of ripples the water a little bit. It doesn't actually do very much, so definitely an upgrade there. The final thing to talk about is print quality. Now these parts, this printer printed its own upgrades, and on these parts I can see some slight ghosting or ringing artifacts, which is to be expected. This is a heavy bed, and so you know that inertial mass moving back and forth will manifest as uh, you know ringing, ghosting. So here's a Benchy that I printed on this printer, and let's, uh, let's peel that off, take a close look at it. We actually cannot, well, we can almost kind of sort of see some of the ghosting, some of the ringing right there on the portals. But look at this. All that amazing print quality on a 92A uh, filament. So this TPU is getting kind of wet. That's why all the stringing, and that's why that's happening as well. So if I dry this filament, I could get even better results. Actually, let's compare this Benchy to one that I made on the Mingda D4 uh, with the exact same um, filament and the same sliced file, the exact same G-code. And uh, we can see that there is uh, pronounced improvement there. There's this drooping crap that you're seeing isn't present on that one. And also up here at the front, that uh, window across the top, the bridging is better. So uh, what, but, Look at what happened on the D4. We had this whole artifact happen. So it looks like we're getting better part cooling here around the back on the D4, but up at the front. But here's the thing. I think I printed this one at 10 degrees hotter. So see, you get more variability from slicer settings than you're gonna get in the printer. However, I do suspect that the part cooling I made on this printer with that um, extra bit of distance, and also it's a bit more flat. So I think it's a little bit more restricted as far as the part cooling goes. Here on the D4, you can see it's a bit more compact and I think we're gonna get uh, better cooling action. So score another point for the D4 hot end and for my upgrades to it. I couldn't make this more compact without modifying this metal and I know that you guys hate cutting and grinding on metal so I didn't even bother doing that. I definitely prefer the D4 hot end to the uh, the E3D V6 and the Bond Tech. I just I don't like it. It's a copy of a Western design and it's got a longer travel path there. So that's 100 millimeters basically from the um, 
from the gears, from the hob gears to the uh, the tip of the nozzle. Now you'll never even notice printing anything <laughs> more stiff than 92A. That just pretty much is relevant to really flexible materials. All right, let's jump on the computer and break these two printers down by the numbers and see where they stand on the overall scoring matrix. As always, the disclaimer that this scoring matrix is my attempt to objectively measure these printers based on the sum of their parts. It's not a holistic picture, and even though I'm attempting to be objective, there's a lot of subjectivity involved. Uh, I'm just giving these things a point score for each attribute, for each sort of like, you know, based on the steppers for the Z direction, that sort of a thing. And yeah, just kind of ascribing a number to it. I try to be consistent. I go back and I update the totals a little bit. Uh, so the you'll notice the scores, if you go watch previous videos, the scores might, you know, increase or decrease by a point or two here or there. So that's what's going on. Um, anyway, the Mingda Rock 3 Pro is the number four scoring printer of all time, of all the printers that I've reviewed. And it's um, following behind the Mingda D4 Pro, which I think you should certainly get. When the D4 Pro came out, it was about the same price as the Mingda Rock 3 Pro. And it's just such a tragedy that the D4 Pro is no longer available anywhere uh, reasonable. You can get it from like some of the Chinese companies, Chinese websites for like $700, $800, I think $799. So way overpriced now, not one to buy, but it was like $550 when it first came out and that was that was a steal i love that printer for that price um, even though it is a um a mendel style frame with that moving bed a big heavy moving bed we need to get away from this like i can't i've been saying this for years you guys the the, the only reason ming to ming to style printers are so popular is because prusa owns the marketing on the internet and prusa doesn't innovate anymore <laughs> he's got the same crappy printers they're all they're all mendel versions you know, and, and he's, that's, he doesn't want to do a core XY, so China's not going to follow, and China's not going to make a core XY. So we're stuck with with this crappy frame style. But um, as far as this crappy frame style, frame style goes, the Mingda Rock 3 Pro is doing pretty good, you guys. Um, pretty good. So let's look at this here. The Mingda Rock 3 Pro, followed by the Artillery Sidewinder. You can go watch that old video. Uh, followed by just the regular old Mingda, Mingda, Mingda Rock 3. And I think these are the three printers to really compare. Um, these are all 300 millimeter um, bed size, like squared 300 millimeters, and they are all um, Mendel style printers with that bed moving in the Y direction, Y axis. So yeah, two points better for the Rock 3 Pro than the um, artillery sidewinder and another which is two points better than the Mingda Rock 3 just the regular run. Well there you have it guys and gal that is a fantastic uh, printer. If you are in the market for what starts to get into large format printers so 300 millimeters actually I think it's 320 uh, squared on the bed there then this is I think the best option on the market. I, hands down go get it. Um, However, if this is going to be your first printer and you don't want to spend so much money, I think you're better off starting with the Mingda D2. You're going to have a lot of the touchscreen uh, capability, same electronics built into the D2, and uh, I like the hot end better on the D2, although it is more finicky. You do have to kind of dial it in, so there's that. Take that as you will. The Mingda Rock 3, just the regular non-pro version, also good, but to say it again, I think the Rock 3 Pro is worth the extra hundred dollars and I think we're gonna leave it there check out a future video actually I think I'll be working on this next the upgrade to the Mingda D2 I'm gonna put a duet control board in there uh, so yeah that'll be fun and a big shout out and thank you to these guys these are my patreon supporters without their help I would not definitely I would not be making a channel uh, anymore you know that I only earned like like $400 last month from advertising revenue on this channel and it's pretty much become my full-time gig. So without, I mean, this is 100% Patreon driven at this point. It's, it's kind of laughable, the, uh, the paltry income that I get from Google. Yeah, so thank you, big thank you to these guys. Um, and that's about that. Thanks for watching, see you next time.